this term on Ezekiel. But before we go any further, I'm going to open our time together in a word of prayer. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your scriptures, uh, which are able to make us wise unto salvation and are useful for um, teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And uh, we do indeed want to be equipped by them for every good work. And as we come to this book of Ezekiel, it is uh, foreign and unknown to the vast majority of us. Uh, And um, yet we're here tonight because we're keen to learn. And so would you bless our time together that we might learn not just about this um, intriguing book of the Old Testament, but really about you. We pray your blessing, not just over our time tonight, but our, our whole time this term in Ezekiel, that as a consequence of our study, we would indeed know you better. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, without any further ado, I'm going to invite our um, keynote speaker, I suppose, for the night, Dr. Dan Wu. Would you please welcome him up? Welcome. Thanks, Scott. You've been here before, haven't you? I have, yeah, a couple of times, yeah. Cool, Hmm. cool. Um, So I am just going to ask you some questions that I've, I'm just riffing off the little bio on the Moore College website. Right, So yeah. hopefully that's okay. <laughs> uh, so this is Dr. Daniel Wu. He's an Old Testament lecturer uh, from Moore College, which is kind of the um, Anglican uh, Theological College in Sydney, in Newtown in Sydney, in the uh, trendy inner west. Um, and he is a doctor in the sense of having a PhD, and he did his study on, let me get this right, glory, honour and shame in Ezekiel. Yeah. So tonight's in your wheelhouse get to Ezekiel in a moment. Tell us firstly, mate, what, you, what you've got in the way of family. Yep. Um, I mean, I've said you're an Old Testament lecturer, but what does that really mean? Mm. And maybe tell us what church you go to as well. Yeah, sure. Um, well, thanks for having me, everyone. It's uh, great to be back. I have visited a couple of times, but um, yeah, it's really nice to be with you. And I uh, hope uh, we're going to have a great evening together. Uh, in terms of your questions, so I'm married to Chrissy, and uh, we have uh, three boys. Uh, so we have Liam, who's 13. He's in year eight. Uh, Archie, who's nine, in year four, and Harry, who's two, uh, sorry, seven, who's in year two. Okay. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't want to get too in a westy that way. We just added another family member, but it's a four-legged one, so we just got a puppy over the holidays, uh. and so uh, that's uh, Banjo. He's, he's uh, two months, and uh, lots of fun, but also getting a bit nippy, so, you know. What, what breed? Is the, is yeah, the... it's a bit of a weird one. So uh, he's, <laughs> he's called a tamarook, right, which we'd never heard of. But when we were uh, thinking about getting a dog, um, we had some friends and saw some pictures on Facebook and had some posts that it was a really nice dog, non-shedding. And so, um, so yeah, we went for one of them. It's, it's basically a labradoodle, um, but the breeders are very insistent. It's not a labradoodle. Okay. It's a labradoodle. Okay. Now, I was, I was going to ask you which of your three sons do you like the most at the moment, but uh, seeing as you've got a dog, way more interesting. So <laughs> yeah. do you think puppies are cuter than babies? Ooh. Ooh. It's okay to say yes, because I've got three sons and puppies are totally <laughs> cuter yeah. than babies. Oh, yeah, oh, look. I reckon. Yeah, I'm going to go yes at the moment. All right. <laughs> Why not? Excellent. Good. Correct <laughs> yeah, answer. He's pretty, it's pretty, pretty hard to resist him uh, when he gives you those eyes. So, you know, yeah. it's all okay. right. Nice. Um, now, just for church, you said you go to Narrenburn, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Narrenburn Anglican, so I guess just down that way, uh, lower North Shore, just next yep. to North Sydney. Cool. So we've been there for about uh, nine years. All yep. right. Hmm. Okay, nice. Now, on your bio, Dan, it said that uh, you were into fishing and it said that three or four times in the bio, so I, I take it that is kind of your main pastime. Are mm. you any good at fishing? Oh. Um, well, uh, I, I figured out over many years that fishing is a volume game. That is, you're a good fisherman if you go enough because just sheer time, eventually you get something. And so, you know, I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. Um, uh, I, I do love it, and I've had people who have known what they're doing uh, teach me a lot of things. Okay. Um, yep. So yeah, yeah. Had some good times fishing. Pulled in some nice fish. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll leave it there. Um, now you are an OT, OT meaning Old Testament, Old Testament lecturer. We get, well, obviously, we're thinking about Ezekiel, but um, you teach more than Ezekiel. What is it mm. about the Old Testament that you kind of lights your fire? Uh, well, I think if you 
think about the, the Bible and particularly Jesus in the Gospel a little bit like a, a crown. Like you've got a crown jewel in the middle, which is the, the centerpiece which you want to uh, make sure shines brightest. But around it, you've got um, the entire crown. And, uh, uh, or another way to think of it is uh, you've got an iceberg where uh, only one-ninth of the iceberg sits above the water, eight-ninths sits below the water, but you need everything to make up the whole iceberg. And I think in some ways that's a little bit like the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Bible. That is, the Old Testament is the crown and the jewels that frame the gospel and make it shine in its uh, highest brilliance and, and show you the magnificence of the gospel, the greatest. Or... Uh, the Old Testament is the, the massive foundation um, that makes the gospel, when a ship runs into it, um, tear through the side and sink it to the depths. Mm. If, that sin, if that ship is sinful, that's great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, so I think when I, when I went through, uh, I, I never really thought I'd end up as a, a theological lecturer. Um, so I was very much... Uh, not your typical Asian kid growing up uh, in that uh, I always fumbled through school and barely scraped through. Same thing with uni. I never thought that uh, being a nerd was a good thing to be. Um, but when I got to Moore College where I teach now and, and started studying, I think I studied for the first time um, something I really, really loved. Uh, but I had a very clear sense that I was there for four years to get my theological degree because that would equip me to uh, go and, go and uh, do ministry in a church. Um, but I guess I, I, as I studied, there, I had a particular affinity with the Old Testament and with the Hebrew language. Um, I, I suppose my inner Asian awoke and uh, something in me just said, look, you, you love this stuff, so um, throw yourself into it. Um, and so I finished college and started working for a church and we had some friends who we really respected as Christians, a bit older, a bit more mature, said, there's actually not that many just solid Bible-believing Old Testament scholars out there. Um, so if that's a strength that God has given you, you should think about that as a ministry. And so after a lot of thought and prayer and uh, you know, rethinking about where we we're going to go in life, uh, we, we decided to... Um, go back and do some more study and uh, head down this path. And uh, the, the other thing that, that tipped me towards it was that same person said, um, you can do the ministry of one person and that's a great thing, but you can also be part of preparing hundreds of people for ministry and that also is a great thing. Mm. So uh, we thought, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Give that a crack. Give it a crack. Excellent. Uh, look, I have one more question about, about Ezekiel, but um, I think... There's no point us just riffing on this. We'll get straight into it. So thanks so sure. much, Dan, for coming. Uh, Dan will speak for maybe 45, 50 minutes. Then we're going to have a five-minute break, and then we'll come back for any questions that you might have before wrapping up around about nine-ish. So that's the sort of time frame we're going. Uh, as you can see, if you want to download the notes, you can use the QR code there. Other than that, it's over to you, Dan. Thanks, Scott. Right. All right, well, thank you again, everyone, for having me. And it is such a great privi privilege to be with you tonight. Uh, so we're going to have a look at Ezekiel, and um, I guess for those of you who are familiar with it a little bit, or even if you're not, uh, you may know it's a pretty intimidating book. It's quite a big one in the Old Testament, and it, it's, uh, it ranges over a whole heap of stuff. So trying to get a feel for it can be actually quite a challenge, but it is a great book to get into. And so just uh, to give you a quick idea, hopefully you've got access to the outline either in paper form or um, on your device. And basically, what I want to do is I want to start with a big picture. What are we talking about? If you were to sum up Ezekiel um, in a nutshell, what would it be about? And then I want to try and get a little bit more into the particulars and the details and the background of Ezekiel as a way of helping you just uh, frame Ezekiel in his context and try and understand uh, some of the particulars about his message. And then we're going to try and see where Ezekiel... Um, pushes through to Jesus and the gospel, the New Testament, and then what that means for us as Christians. So that's the basic shape of the night. We're going to go overview, a little bit more detail, and then um, New Testament and application to us as Christians. So I hope that's going to be helpful for you, and uh, let's get into it. So um, as I said, I think 
this is a really challenging book um, to delve into, and so good on you for doing it, but it's great also just to be aware that there will be particular um, challenges that arise. Uh, what are some of the challenges? Number one, it's very big. It's a huge book. I think in length, it may be um, the second longest of the prophets. And uh, so it's, it's 48 chapters long, and some of those chapters are huge. And also, uh, there's lots of different sections in the book. And so it's not like there's a whole heap of narrative um, that tells you the, the historical story of what's going on that you can hang things on. Often, um, Ezekiel will just jump from prophecy to prophecy, and he'll refer to certain things but not give you the historical connections. And so that makes it challenging because sometimes you don't know what are you talking about? You know, I thought you were talking about this, but now you seem to be talking about something completely different. What's going on there? And uh, when you read literature like that, it can really throw you and make you go, look, I don't know what's going on. I feel like giving up. Uh, tied into that, Ezekiel is very strange. There's no other way to, to say it. Um, there's, there's lots of obscure names about nations and people and events it's very distant from um, our experience of life and even uh, our experience of the Bible. Uh, secondly, Ezekiel himself, there's no other way to say it, he is a weird dude, right? He does strange things, um, talks in strange ways, and just seems a little bit all over the shop um, at first glance. And then the other thing is that in Ezekiel, there's lots of strange terms and concepts that um, we're not really used to talking about, uh, a lot of us anyway, so things like uh, defilement and the temple. Um, and uh, I guess even as Christians, once you talk about those things, defilement, temple, you're already thinking, well, that's Old Testament stuff. We're New Testament people. So there can be a distance um, and a strangeness to what Ezekiel is saying. And then the final challenge, I think, in reading Ezekiel is it's very confronting. And so there is some highly graphic, uh, violent, and offensive imagery in Ezekiel, um, including a lot about sexual activity. Um, a God himself in Ezekiel, to some people, seems overly harsh and punitive and even self-absorbed in his own glory. And the descriptions of humans, um, it's not very uh, flattering. And so uh, the way that uh, humans can be described uh, are very negative, very disparaging and very anti, I guess, uh, some of our culture of affirmation. And so I think for all those reasons, uh, Ezekiel can be a very, very challenging book to get into. And you might find as you read some of those reactions coming up in you, that's perfectly normal, that's perfectly natural, that's part of the reading experience of Ezekiel. So why should we then? Why read Ezekiel? Well, I think there are some excellent reasons to read Ezekiel. Number one, it shows us the overwhelming holy majesty of God. So you cannot read Ezekiel and come away with anything but the fact that this book portrays God as magnificent and worthy of worship. And as the flip side of that then, once you see the holy majesty of God, it shows in stark relief the overwhelming sinfulness of the human heart. And again, I think that is a message that we in our culture here in Sydney are in grave danger of losing because we swim in the tide of affirmation around us. Uh, again, I think one thing that Ezekiel does um, almost uniquely amongst the Old Testament books is that it shows us the overwhelming awe of God's judgment. Um, you, you do not want to take God's judgment lightly. Um, and so Ezekiel, I think, uh, reminds us of that in no uncertain terms. But on the flip side of that, we see God's overwhelming love in Ezekiel in a way that uh, is hard to match in any other book in the Old Testament. And then the, the final and possibly um, the most compelling reason for us to read Ezekiel is because the New Testament writers actually draw heavily on Ezekiel to explain who Jesus is, what he's done for us, what he's doing in us, and what he's going to do when he returns. And so if you want to understand the way that the New Testament explains Jesus, it often draws from Ezekiel. We'll see that a little bit later on in the presentation. 
And so I think what you get from reading Ezekiel, it, bottom line is this, more than any other book, I think Ezekiel clears away the gloss of sin that we so easily kind of erect in front of our eyes so that we can see the truth of who God is very, very clearly. So I think um, for those who are more visual learners, uh, why do we read Ezekiel? Because it helps clear our vision so that we see the glory of our God as clearly as possible and can build our lives around that. So I think um, that's why we read Ezekiel. All right. Now, um, uh, what I like to do, uh, particularly in Old Testament books, which, which can be a little bit more unfamiliar to us, is I like to try and give you a a sort of a nutshell summary, if you had to distill the 48 chapters of Ezekiel down to a single sentence, uh, what would it be? I think this is it. Uh, the holy God won't let anything get in the way of dwelling with his holy people. Okay, I think that's the overarching concern in Ezekiel, that all the barriers to God dwelling with his people are overcome. And what are those barriers? It's their enemies in the world and the sin in their hearts, okay? So that's what Ezekiel's about. The holy God won't let anything get in the way of dwelling with his holy people, not their enemies and nor their sin. All right, and a couple of verses just to try and um, capture that. So uh, the first one is that God in Ezekiel is very clearly acting primarily for his own sake, for the sake of his holy name. So that top line, the holy God, that's actually critical to Ezekiel's message. And so in Ezekiel chapter 36, which is one of the key salvation passages in the book, God says, it is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things, but for the sake of my holy name. And so in Ezekiel, God acts primarily for his own glory and for his own holiness and his love and salvation, in a sense, um, actually flows from that and is, is consequent on that first one, that he is the holy God. Uh, but if there is a key phrase for Ezekiel, then it's also from that chapter, and this is the title that we've given tonight, uh, the whole concern of God in Ezekiel is that people do not see God clearly and do not know him for who he is, and he is determined that that will be done away with. And so the key phrase that keeps coming up in Ezekiel, why does God act the way he does? So that then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, so the holy God won't let anything get in the way of dwelling with his holy people, not their enemies, nor their sin. All right, now to, to understand Ezekiel, um, and to, I guess, try and bring him closer to us in terms of our understanding and experience, it's really helpful to see where he comes in the flow of the Bible's unfolding plan of God in the narrative of the Old Testament in particular. And uh, you may be familiar with this if you've been around uh, good Bible teaching churches like this one for a little while, that there are some key points in what we call biblical theology or the, 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 the history of salvation in the Bible there are some really key points that occur that are described through the Bible that form the background to Ezekiel. And so the first one is the beginning of the Bible where uh, creation happens and um, uh, God sets up the way that he as creator is going to relate to his creation and particularly to his people. But then we see the massive disruption to God's plan in the fall and in sin as Adam and Eve reject God and disobey his command and are cast out of the Garden of Eden. Um, and um, uh, that, act, that sort of mini theme actually rebounds again and again through the Old Testament, and we'll see this a little bit later on, but it's very, very important in Ezekiel's understanding of what he's prophesying about. Now, you might also know that God doesn't leave us um, in this state of separation from him and uh, our subjection to death and darkness and decay. And so in order to overcome our rebellion against him and sin, uh, God starts choosing people and in particular making promises to those people. The first significant one that we need to pay attention to 
is Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. And uh, I'm just about to get into some passages um, that relate to this, but Abraham, very, very important. In some ways, he's, he's the one who receives the foundational promises that Ezekiel is going to build on. But then the next significant um, characters are Moses and Joshua, and in particular because Moses and Joshua bring God's people Israel into his promised land. And if you remember, one of the, the big problems in the fall was that God's people were ejected from God's land in the Garden of Eden. And here in Moses and Joshua, his new people, Israel, are brought back into the land that he has chosen for them. And so it's almost like creation is restarting again. Um, and then we reach the high point of Israel's history in the kings David and Solomon. And so this is about 1000 BC. And uh, what we're going to see on the next slide is that God makes particular promises to David and Solomon that, again, lie in the background of what Ezekiel is doing. So here are the promises. From Genesis 1 to 3, we see that initial promise. What is God's intent for his creation and particularly for his people? Um, it is when he creates them, he blesses them, and he says, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And so God's plan is that his people would be blessed in his presence and that they would live in his land and rule over it perfectly under him. We then see in Abraham that uh, once that has been lost, God makes this promise, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. And then he says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And he's pointing to, at that point, uh, the land that will eventually become the land of Israel. Moses and Joshua, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, uh, Moses makes this promise to the people of Israel that God says, every place where you set your foot in this land will be yours. No one will be able to stand against you. And then uh, David and Solomon, you have this wonderful promise where God says to David, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne will be established forever. And so what we see in the lead up to Ezekiel is this magnificent series of promises that God has made to his people that in light of the catastrophe of sin and the fall, God is going to bring his people back into his land, dwell with them once again, and almost create this protective bubble around them so that none of the sin and darkness that surrounds them can ever uh, threaten them again. Sounds wonderful. The problem is that um, uh, very shortly after, it all starts going to the dogs. And so you might know that after Solomon... Uh, the kingdom actually has an internal civil war almost. There is a secession in the kingdom of Israel, and the kingdom actually splits into two. And very confusingly, the one kingdom, Israel, becomes two kingdoms, and it becomes the northern kingdom, which retains the name Israel, and the southern kingdom, which takes the name Judah. And so from Israel, you've now got Israel and Judah. So one of the things that's really confusing sometimes about reading the Old Testament is when the name Israel is used. And so sometimes uh, in the Old Testament, Israel means the entire um, group of people descended from Abraham. Uh, that's the one nation. But other times it means the northern kingdom, uh, which is the, the northern part of the divided kingdom, as opposed to Judah, the southern part of the divided kingdom. And so sometimes when you're reading the Old Testament and you hear the word Israel, you actually need to stop and think, is he talking about Israel, the whole people of God, or are we talking specifically about the northern kingdom at this point? Now, very sadly, what happens is in 722 BC, the world superpower of the time, Assyria, comes along and basically wipes out the northern kingdom, Israel, and we almost never hear from them again in the rest of the Old Testament. And then, about 150 or so years later, um, uh, another nation arises, Babylon, and the southern kingdom, Judah, is all that is left of the people of God by that point. And so, uh, I've highlighted these in red because these are the, uh, the events that 
Ezekiel particularly prophesies in the context of. That is, Babylon um, comes along and Judah has been seen as the people of God. They've seen Israel destroyed, but they themselves were still safe. And so they started to think, oh, that's okay. We're still the people of God and God will protect us just like he did against the Assyrians. But unfortunately, what happens is that it doesn't work. And so the next superpower to arrive, Babylon, rises up, and despite Judah's attempts, uh, it conquers Judah in 597. And then 10 years later, it comes back and basically levels Jerusalem, the capital of Judah. Now, thankfully, um, fast forward about another 70 years, and uh, God's people are allowed to return to Judah under the Persian Empire, and then we have uh, a little bit of time between the Testaments, and then Jesus comes. But if you have a look at those, um, uh, the words in red and that period that I've just put into that little red box, that's the focus of Ezekiel's prophecies, but it lies um, on the foundation of that whole progression of the Bible to that point. So Ezekiel prophesies into this situation where you've seen the promises of God grow, and then decline and be threatened and then seem to be completely undone. So, um, uh, another important thing to, to just note is that the fact that the conquest of Jerusalem by Babylon actually happens in two separate phases. And so, the two key dates you need to remember are 597 and 587. So, 597 BC and 587 BC. And uh, 597 BC is the first time that Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar comes along and conquers Jerusalem. So breaches the wall, sacks the temple, takes away all the treasures. But also, um, what the Babylonians did when they conquered a people was they would uh, not destroy the city, the capital city completely. They would basically um, take the the most young, promising people of the city and deport them back to Babylon. So sort of lifting off the cream from the top, taking them back to Babylon. And the reason why was because Babylon wanted to grow into this major world multicultural center. And it also wanted to grow its kingdom in a way that the nations that it conquered couldn't rise up in rebellion. And so their strategy was, what we'll do is we'll take the, the best and the brightest of the young people from everyone we conquer, and bring them back to Babylon. And that'll do two things at the same time. Number one, it'll mean that all the best and brightest from around the world are in Babylon. So Babylon will be like the forefront of uh, world culture. It'll be wonderful. But it'll also have the effect of basically cutting off the head of the nation that we've just subdued. So, so all their best and brightest are not there anymore, so they can't rise up against us. That's a pretty brilliant strategy. Worked for a while. And so that's what they did. So Nebuchadnezzar came in and um, put out the king Jehoiakim, deported a whole stack of people to Babylon, including Ezekiel, and then installed a puppet king, Zedekiah. Now, about 10 years later, uh, Zedekiah actually tried to rebel against Babylon and start um, a, a war for independence. And Nebuchadnezzar basically saw it and said, no, nah, and squashed it. And so what happened was he came in again against um, Zedekiah and, uh, and against uh, Hophra of Egypt, who Zedekiah formed an alliance with, and Zedekiah just basically wiped them out and destroyed the city and pretty much brought Jerusalem to nothing, a, a whole set of ruins and all those sorts of things. Okay, and um, the reason why that's, so important for understanding Ezekiel in particular is because Ezekiel's book, the structure of the book, actually matches those events. So the first half of Ezekiel, chapters 1 to 32, uh, the prophecies are written in the time between the first conquest and 587, the final destruction. And then in chapters 33 to 48, the second half of the book, they are written in the light of the fall of Jerusalem. Um, but that's also tied into the tone of Ezekiel's message of the two halves of the book. And we'll see that in a little while. But I'll just draw that to your attention now. 
Okay, now just um, so that you know that we're dealing with uh, real life and history and geography, this is what we're talking about. So this is um, the Fertile Crescent in the Middle East. Uh, you can see Babylonia up there to the north and the east. You can see Judah um, just at the bottom edge of the Mediterranean Sea there. And you can see in yellow, that was the entirety of the Babylonian kingdom at the height of Babylon's power. And so um, just to um, give you a pictorial representation, so Ezekiel is prophesying about God's city, Jerusalem, but he is doing it from exile in Babylon. Okay, so he's going to talk about Jerusalem over there and talk about the people in it and what's happening to it, but he is prophesying sorry, in Babylon over there. Okay. All right. Now, um, what you may or may not be aware of is um, all the different books of the Bible are quite different in their style and character, and that's because even though the one God speaks through the entire Bible, um, he speaks through different people and through their personalities, through their experiences, through the way that they think and talk, etc. And um, when it comes to Ezekiel, that, I think that's really helpful to bear in mind because um, actually part of how Ezekiel writes is built on who he is. And so if you uh, want to open up your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, You'll see there that actually we get a little introduction to Ezekiel himself in verses 1 to 3. And we're told a couple of things about him. It says, In my 30th year, um, while I was among the exiles by the river Kabar, which is um, in Babylon, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. And then in verse 2, it says, The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest. And that tells us um, three really significant things about Ezekiel and his style. Number one, he is a prophet. So the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, and that's a standard way of introducing one of the prophets of God who is going to declare God's word to his people, um, his covenant word to his people. But you'll also see that Ezekiel is, verse 2, a priest. And um, uh, that also is really significant but one of the nice things, well, significant things about Ezekiel is actually the in my 30th year um, is actually really significant because for priests in Israel at that point, the 30th year, so when you became 30, that was the time you actually entered the temple service. And yet Ezekiel is in Babylon. And so there's a huge problem for him as a priest. And yet he is given this remarkable privilege of almost being the priest in Babylon for God's people. It's quite lovely in one sense uh, that Ezekiel uh, so rudely had his, the course of his life and his plans interrupted, and yet he gets to serve as God's priest in exile. But, uh, verse 1, I saw visions of God. And so Ezekiel is a prophet who is a priest, and his particular thing is he was given unique visions of God's glory. Okay, so um, that means as we read Ezekiel, there are going to be parts of his prophecies that remind us of the law and the covenant, if you're familiar with those from the Old Testament. There are going to be other parts of his prophecy that remind us of the temple and the sacrificial system. And then there are going to be other um, parts of his prophecy that are more visionary and seer-like, where... Um, he receives revelations uh, directly from God. And so um, uh, I think that can help in terms of just reading different passages that sometimes he's bringing to the front the priestly side of things, sometimes it's the visionary side of things, sometimes it's the prophetic side of things, but it's all woven together into one message. But the other thing to note about Ezekiel is that he is a prophet who is a priest given visions of God's glory while God's people are in the midst of trauma. So basically their whole identity, their whole security, uh, their homeland, everything has just collapsed. 
Uh, this is absolutely disastrous. And so it's, it's the seeming failure of every one of God's promises, a horrible situation to be in, highly stressful, highly distressing. And some of the um, confronting language that we have in Ezekiel, I think, arises out of that context and situation. Uh, some of the other unique features of Ezekiel's prophetic style are his use of what we call sign acts, where he sort of does a little skit, church skit, uh, but not a G-rated one. Usually they're, they're pretty spicy. Um, and so he actually enacts what is going on or what is just about to happen to make the message of God really, really vivid. Um, secondly, his stark theocentric tone, and what I mean by that is God-centered. So, you know, we tend to think about um, people a lot. We, we want to take care of people. We want to love people. Uh, we want to value people. Absolutely. But if it is at the expense of God being at the center of everything, then it is utterly wrong. And so Ezekiel is very, very clear. And, and this was one of Judah's problems, actually, as we'll see in a second, that they had started to think, hang on, what's going on here? God should be here for me. God should be here to care for me, and yet everything is going wrong. What's going on? And Ezekiel's answer is, well, hang on, it's not about you, it's about God. Uh, and then thirdly, um, the other thing that sets Ezekiel apart from a lot of others uh, is just the um, intensity, I guess, of his shocking, extreme language and images. But again, I think part of that is just him, but a big part of that is the context of trauma that the exile created. Okay, how are we going? Whoa, where's the time going? I might have to fly through this a little bit because we, um, okay, thanks, Scott. All right. Mm -hmm -hmm. All right, no, no, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, I just want to step through again, prophet, priest, visionary. Okay, that's the three categories that you should be thinking about Ezekiel in. So, so the way that Ezekiel thinks and the way that he addresses how his people think um, go along these lines. In the ancient times, in the ancient Near East, people tended to think of life in terms of uh, the people, their God, and their land. And that sort of little little uh, triad was basically um, life and security for them. And so if they were in place, then everything should be hunky-dory. And so technically Israel had their deity, Yahweh, they had their land, Israel, they were a people, Judah, so God should have protected them. Right? That, that's, that's how people thought back then. And the particular relationship that God had with Israel was built on these different promises that he gave them. So the first one was the Mosaic Covenant when he gave him the Ten Commandments and the law that sprang from it. And Moses declared the law and said, if you live by these laws, God will be with you and no one will conquer you. Um, they also had the land which they had repelled lots and lots of enemies from. And then they had the covenant with David, your kingdom will endure forever. And they also had the temple uh, that sat in Jerusalem and was meant to be the, the earthly dwelling place for God. And so they technically should have formed something of an unshakable pillar of security uh, for Israel. If, if we are able to um, upkeep the law and do everything that Moses commanded, then everything should be fine. So that's part one, and so that's what Ezekiel addresses. But then there's also... Part two, Ezekiel as a priest. And so within that whole um, covenant that Moses set up, uh, you have this other system of holiness. And so in the book of Leviticus in particular, uh, God says to his people, I am the holy God, and the word holy means set apart, distinct, separate. And so God says, I am God like no other, and you as my people must be people like no other. And to, um, to symbolize that and to express that, uh, what we have in the holiness system of Leviticus, which the priests kind of oversaw, is this whole system where you lived demonstrating the holiness of God 
and the holy people of God. And so one way that I found very helpful, one of my friends summed, up, summed it up as, uh, back in the 80s when I was growing up in school, uh, when they wanted to teach us about numbers, they used these coloured rods. And anyone familiar with these Cuisinair rods? All right. <clears throat> well, if you're not, that's them. There's basically, it's a box of uh, sticks, which you can see on the uh, left-hand side, and they're sticks of different colours and different lengths. And basically what you do is you use the coloured blocks to represent numbers. And so you learn to count and measure and add by using the blocks and the numbers. You know, three little white squares equals one green thing, and so a green thing is worth three, and that sort of thing. <coughs> so they're not actually numbers, but the system enables you to teach something. And likewise with the holiness system of Leviticus. And so these words may be familiar to you from the Bible that sometimes people are talked about as holy and clean or unclean. And um, what Leviticus does is that actually, it actually sets up a sort of a, a sliding scale that you can be holy, you can be clean, or you can be unclean. And the way that you enter into one of these states, if you want to become holy from being clean, then you have to be consecrated, so made holy. If you want to move from unclean to clean, then you have to do something to be cleansed. You know, shake a bit of water over you or um, stay outside for a little bit or offer this sacrifice. Um, do something whereby you can move from unclean to clean. And um, you can also do things or encounter things that move you the other way. So you can move from holy to clean to unclean by becoming defiled by something. And so if you read Leviticus and, and give it a crack, you'll see there's a whole stack of stuff um, like eating the wrong animal, um, touching a corpse, uh, finding mold or mildew in your house, and all these things can move you towards the unclean, and then you can shake some water-soaked hyssop over you or um, wave some stuff over your house or sacrifice this or that, and that will cleanse you and consecrate you again. And... The, the real critical thing is, often when you are unclean, what you need to do is you need to remove yourself from the, the camp of God's people and live outside of God's people and God's presence for a while and until you are cleansed again and you can come back into God's presence. And so um, there's this whole system there set up in Leviticus uh, to demonstrate this. But actually... Uh, like I said, that's actually more of a symbolic system. So it's not so much that, for example, if you have a, a, a skin blemish and a skin disease, you are classified as unclean and you have to live outside the camp for a little bit. But as soon as it clears up, you can come back in, you just show it to the priest, and if he says, yep, you're good, then you can come back in. And so it's not so much the thing itself necessarily that actually counts is what it symbolizes. And what it symbolizes is that there are things that are associated with sin and death and they mean that you cannot be in the presence of the Holy God. But there is something that can bring you back into the presence of the Holy God and that tends to be something like sacrifice. So a dove or um, a lamb or a bull those sorts of things. And so um, in Israel, this is how they lived. You know, you, you had to uh, participate in this system. And what it was trying to teach you is that what is holy, that is God, cannot be associated with what is unclean. It must be cut off from God. It cannot be in its presence. Uh, but you can move back in through sacrifice. Okay, so... That also is in the thought realm of the day. And Israel, uh, well, Judah at that point was pretty happy uh, with this system because they said, great, if I become unclean, if I do something wrong, uh, that's fine. I'll just give a sacrifice. I'm back in. No worries. So they thought, yep, we can do that. And that's working well for us. Or so we think. Now, the third, uh, the third kind of area of Ezekiel is this visionary of the glory of God. And, um, oh, we've got 10 minutes left, Scott. What are we going to do? 
Got 20, okay. All right. In some ways, I think this is actually the most important, um, and it's, it's actually the one that ties in Ezekiel to the, uh, to the gospel most clearly. And that is, Ezekiel was a visionary who saw, was given a vision of the glory of God. And so if you keep on reading in chapter 1, uh, you'll see there the description. I won't, I won't uh, give too much away because I know Nathan's going to preach on it this Sunday. Uh, but you'll see there, Ezekiel has this overwhelming vision of this brilliant figure coming towards him who is God, God on the throne. It, <clears throat> and it is um, an overwhelming light show of God's glory and brilliance. Uh, but the whole notion of glory is actually almost the central theme of the Bible. That is, if you wanted to summarize the message of the Bible, uh, you could summarize it as uh, the message of the Bible is that God reveals his glory to his people. Um, glory is basically a word for the importance, the magnificence, the splendor of someone. And um, uh, you could summarize the Bible, therefore, as uh, God is going to reveal the importance, the splendor, the magnificence of his being to his people. Um, there's one of my favorite theologians is the American revival theologian Jonathan Edwards. And uh, in his tract, The End for Which God Created the World, he likens God to a light source like the sun and us, the earth creation, uh, to a mirror. And he says that the reason God created the world was to pour forth his glory into the world. And uh, Edwards from the Bible uh, basically says that when you think about what is the magnificence of God, what is the importance, etc., uh, usually when we think about it in human terms, we think of um, our own kind of proud splendor. We want to show that we are wonderful. We want to draw everybody to ourselves and say, look at me, look at me, look at me. But God's glory is actually the opposite of that. That is, God's glory is his love and his faithfulness to his people. And so uh, what Edwards and, uh, draws from the Bible is that, therefore, the reason God created was to display his glory to his creation. That is, the reason God created was so that he could pour forth his love and faithfulness into what he has made and fill it with joy overflowing. And so he says it in this way, In the creatures knowing, esteeming, loving, rejoicing in, and praising God, the glory of God is both exhibited and acknowledged. His fullness is both received and returned. So basically what he's saying there is that God shows his love to us, love, rejoice, etc. Um, and what happens is we receive that and are filled with it to the overflowing, and therefore we cannot help but return to him love and praise in kind. And so there's this beautiful rebounding love and glory between us and God and God and us, etc. And um, uh, that is really the, the, the plan of God in the Bible. Now, the problem is that we turn away from God, and when we do so, you'll note that a mirror has no light of its own, and so we cannot continue to, to take part in this beautiful relationship that we have with God once we turn away from him. And so in Romans 1, uh, the description of sin there is, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. And because we've kind of turned away and stopped giving glory back to God, what happens is, all the good gifts that he gives us, because they're not being used for that right purpose of being returned to him, they become twisted and distorted and darkened. And so we take the good things of God and turn it into every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. Now, God doesn't want to leave the world in this state, and so he chose Israel through Abraham and his descendants to be his new light in the world. So he, he brings them into his land, he gives them his law, and draws them close to himself because he wants Israel to restart this process 
of love and glory, and so bring the light of his glory to the world. And so Ezekiel 5.5 talks about Jerusalem, which God says, I've set in the center of the nations with countries all around her because he wants Jerusalem to be the place where his love and glory through his people spreads out to all the earth and overcomes the darkness of sin. Okay, does that make sense so far? All right. Now I will fly. <clears throat> the problem is, so, so the, the big question in Ezekiel is, what the heck went wrong? It's a beautiful picture. We were doing our part, God, so what went wrong? And their answers are basically, either it's your fault, God, you promised and you didn't keep your promise, you let us down, or it's our father's fault. So in chapter 18, they said, look, it might be our father's sin, and we're just bearing the consequences. And Ezekiel's 48 chapter long answer is, yeah, nah. It is actually because of your sin. So uh, the first thing that God says to Ezekiel is, son of man, that's his uh, calling card for Ezekiel, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. And so what we see in Ezekiel is again and again, God wants to ram home to the people of Judah that they have broken the three aspects of of what Ezekiel is focusing on. They've broken the covenant, they have defiled themselves, and they have chosen darkness and death. And it's so important that they get that picture right that Ezekiel just goes on and on and makes it more and more serious, more and more repulsive until you cannot help but get the image that Ezekiel says, this is what has happened. Israel, you are just as dark and lost and defiled and disgusting to God as the other nations. All right. Um, Yes, okay, let me skip this. Um, I'm sorry, I am starting to rush because... (laughs) <laughs> I think I'm about a halfway there in my presentation. I think I, I, yeah. You know how when you haven't done something for a while and then you come back to it, you kind of just try and put everything in? I think that's what I did. Um, what's going to be most helpful? Okay. Yeah. Most helpful is I just want to run you through the structure of Ezekiel very quickly. Uh, because, again, it's a long book. It, it sort of goes here, there, and everywhere. But when you pull back and look at it, there's actually a simplicity to its structure that really helps when you're reading it. And it basically falls into two halves, uh, chapters 1 to 32, and then chapters 33 to 48. And um, the two halves, as I said before, actually are split by the final fall of Jerusalem in 587 BC. So the first half spans 597 to 587, And then the second half goes from 587 onwards. And in some ways, what you would expect is, while Jerusalem still stands, there's still hope. But if Jerusalem falls, everything is gone. But Ezekiel actually goes the other way. And he actually says, Jerusalem is in trouble, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. And so we we spend the first half of the book building this growing picture of doom. But then in the the second half of the book, in chapter 33, Ezekiel gets the news from a messenger from Jerusalem that the city has fallen. And unexpectedly, what happens is the tone of his prophecies becomes much more positive. And so it's almost like with the fall of the earthly Jerusalem, we've cleared away almost the problem, and we can now start building the solution. So really interesting that the predominant tone in the first half is judgment, and all the hope passages really start to come to the fore in the second half. You also see a move from the earthly Jerusalem and focus on what's going on there, the sin and defilement, to a heavenly Jerusalem that is coming that will be pure and sinless. And finally, you move from the themes really of... uh, God uncreating Jerusalem and and almost uh, letting death have its play there. And then in the second half, 
you see this beautiful rising chorus of life come up. It's quite amazing. And so, um, so yeah, it's interesting that with the fall of the earth of Jerusalem, you start to see great hope arise. Um, all right, there are some pretty big key chapters. Uh, I think, let me just give you the highlights package. Yep. And I'm just going to go with uh, Ezekiel 34, 36, and then 47, 48. So, 34, I think one of the really fascinating passages in Ezekiel is 34. So, this is at the beginning of the hope passages. And one of the striking images that is used is the the leaders of Israel as shepherds who are basically um, destroying the flock of God's people. And as a result, God himself will come and shepherd his people, bind the brokenhearted, heal them, restore them, and lead them to safe pasture. And if you know your New Testament and some of the passages there, there should be a big nudge, nudge, wink, wink as to who might be the good shepherd. Uh, Ezekiel 36, um, besides God saving for his own glory, the other big theme in that chapter is that God's, the way that God is going to save is by bringing his people a new birth, a new heart, and a new spirit through a new washing with water. And then finally, in Ezekiel 47 to 48, so this is the end of the book now, uh, what we see is with the earthly Jerusalem, in a sense, done away with, uh, we see actually when God saves, he's not just going to make a new earthly Israel, but actually, sorry, a new earthly Jerusalem, but actually this heavenly Jerusalem is going to usher in a new creation complete with a new river and tree of life. A really fascinating way to end this really dark book on such a wonderful note of life and hope. All right, so uh, if you haven't already picked it up, uh, Ezekiel, therefore, stands behind a lot of the key themes in the New Testament. So Ezekiel 34 not only features in the Good Shepherd passage, but it also is behind the feeding of the uh, the 5,000, where Jesus sees the crowds um, harassed and helpless like, like sheep without a shepherd. That's from Ezekiel 34. So if you want to understand what Jesus was doing when feeding the 5,000, Ezekiel 34, as well as uh, Deuteronomy in the wilderness. Uh, you also see Ezekiel chapter 36, I think, behind each of the statements in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, and you also see that Ezekiel 36, the, uh, the born-again new heart passage, uh, that is the background of John 3, of, and obviously John 3.16 there. Uh, we also see particularly the um, uh, themes of Ezekiel and, and especially the river of life in the New Jerusalem um, in the book of Revelation, and in particular the final salvation when Jesus returns. So really key passages in the New Testament actually are drawn from Ezekiel's prophecy. Okay, so um, just to complete the picture, because where we left this kind of vision of God's glory was that Israel, who was meant to display God's glory, God's saving glory to the nations, was darkened and defiled just as much as the other nations. Um, And that's kind of where Ezekiel leaves us in time. And that's why Ezekiel pushes through to Jesus so clearly. Because what we see in the New Testament is that Jesus is the true Israel. Uh, He is the one who kept the covenant. He was the pure, undefiled Lamb of God. And he is the very expression of God's glory, his love and faithfulness. And so Jesus is the one who, in his death and resurrection brings that new birth and cleansing and ushers in the new creation, so shows the glory of God that Israel was meant to do and Ezekiel um, despaired that Israel failed to do. And um, uh, what the Bible ends with is pretty much Ezekiel fulfilled. When he says, because of the work of Jesus, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among his people, and he will dwell with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And so what we see is Ezekiel longs for the coming of Jesus and the return of Jesus now. And it's only because of things like Ezekiel that we understand why the Bible finishes with a passage like Revelation 21. All right. Well, um, I've got a few tips and tricks for reading Ezekiel, but I'm going to skip through them. And I'm just going to leave you because I believe most of you are leaders here who will be hopefully leading some people through Ezekiel. So I'm going to give you some tips for teaching Ezekiel. And so um, I think, again, the challenge with Ezekiel is you can just get lost in the detail and you can get lost in the unfamiliar and confronting language and not quite know what to do with it. And so what I hope is by giving you a little bit of a tour of Ezekiel's thinking and background and context, um, hopefully that's given you now a little bit of insight as to why Ezekiel might write some of these things. And his overwhelming concern is that you are starkly confronted with the God that you need to cling to. And so your goal in teaching Ezekiel should be whatever you do with the passage, at the end of the day, you make sure that you don't miss the point. This passage is meant to connect you to God. So your role as a leader is how do I engage my people with the holy, glorious God who speaks to his people through the words of Ezekiel? And I think if you wanted to break that down into a little bit more detail, um, the best thing you can do is there's always going to be a swirl of stuff in Ezekiel. Can you simplify it to what is this passage basically saying? What is God basically saying through it? And then can you show me one or two details from the passage that show me this is what the passage is saying? And so you want to try and help your members make sense of Ezekiel's original context and concepts as much as you can. And you want your members to grow in their relationship with God. And I think for Ezekiel, the main focus there is um, to confront them with the overwhelming reality of God, uh, which in our society so easily gets muted um, amongst our materialism. And then finally, you want to make sure that they understand how Jesus fulfills this passage in Ezekiel, because I think if you don't have Jesus right there with Ezekiel, it can just be overwhelming and really, really dark. So if you can trace it through to how does Jesus actually answer this passage, uh, then you'll be doing your people a great service. All right, there you go. So bottom line, what has this been all about? When you're reading Ezekiel, this is what you want in your mind. This is what it's about. The holy God won't let anything get in the way of dwelling with his holy people, not their enemies, nor their sin. Thank you very much. Okay, here, so if you've got a question, Dan is up the front. I will take your question, or Bruce will take your question, and I'm sure we'll all benefit from it. Who's going to be first cab off the rank? John, up the back. A uh, really tough question to start. Um, can we get a copy of your slide deck? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I sent one uh, to Nathan, and I'm more than happy for that to go out if people would like it. So, um, yes. Crowd's Phew. happy with that. <laughs> Other questions? Lauren. Thank you. Um, it's a slightly odd question, but I have um, a non-Christian dad who is oddly fascinated by Ezekiel with all the weird imagery stuff. And I've tried to talk about it a few times before, but um, I, do you have any tips or anything about how to tie it back to the, like, I don't know, any tips for tying it back to the actual message of Jesus? Obviously, it's kind of obvious to people who know it already, but to someone who doesn't, it's kind of just like, wow. Any tips? <laughs> um, yes, great question. And, um, yeah, very, very challenging. Uh, I think in some ways you could... 
uh, take a two-pronged approach. Um, and oh, look, at, at the end of the day, obviously, it's, it's God's Spirit who is going to change hearts. So, uh, but from a human perspective, I think the first thing is to try and move from the particular thing, so whether it's defilement or um, a sexual metaphor, whatever it is in Ezekiel, try and boil it down to what is the, the basic confronting theological point that it's trying to make. And so, so try and make it um, not so much just an interesting, how do we interpret someone very weird and what he's saying, great, let's move on with life. It's actually, no, this is actually a message from God. What is that message? Uh, you very simply have done wrong before him, you're cut off from him, you're defiled, you need to turn back to him. But the other, um, the other approach is also off the back of that, to just dwell in the weirdness. Um, because there is this fascination with Ezekiel because he's just so outlandish and so repulsive in a lot of what he says. Um, and we love a scandal. So that's what God has given us in his word. Let's make use of it. Why, why would you um, do things like call people awful names? What a horrible thing to do. Why do you think he does that? Um, wh- when can you think about when it's actually right to call someone an awful name? Um, and then start to talk about the concepts behind that. Well, actually, because you want to show them that there's something desperately wrong with them. Oh, okay, that's really interesting. Let's keep reading. You know? So I think um, simplicity, but then actually use the weirdness to your advantage. That would be my advice. Josh has got a question. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I was just wondering, what was the time frame of this prophecy? Did this happen over you know, one night or was it a series of weeks, days, months? Um, yeah, we, um, from what you, you, you get the occasional um, time reference in Ezekiel and so the, the main two ones are um, the, the experience of, Isra- uh, of Ezekiel in exile as Jerusalem was still standing so sometime between 597 and 587. Um, but it doesn't seem like the actual destruction um, was uh, impending. And so Ezekiel will prophesy the end of Jerusalem coming, but it doesn't seem like it's that close. So it's probably towards 597. But then in chapter 33... Um, the other major time marker uh, is in chapter 33, where, uh, verse 21, In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month on the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came and said, The city has fallen. And so that's definitely 587. And, and so that's really, the, yeah, 1 to 32, it's 590-something, 33 to 48, it's 590, 587, to whenever. That's basically the time frame. Other questions? <laughs> Aaron, Josh's lookalike. We'll go to you first. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Dan, for your lecture, by the way. It was really good, really okay. helpful. So much there. You mentioned there were two things that what, that God won't let um, stop him getting in the way of dealing with his people. One of them was enemies and the other one was sin. Mm. When it comes to enemies... How is that fulfilled in the New Testament? It wasn't necessarily on the, yes. on the slide there. No, Obviously, no. maybe one of the enemies is sin, but that would, could be the other one. Yes. It, like in the New Testament, obviously Jesus said to love your enemies. Yep. Is the, uh, yeah, that's the general role of enemies mm. in the New Testament for the people of God. Yes. Um, well, I'll, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, I'll just rewind a little bit in terms of before we talk about loving enemies, etc. So what you see is is uh, in, in Ezekiel 4 to 24, uh, the main focus is on, on Judah and its sin. And then in 25 to 32, you get this sort of spiralling judgment of the nations because of their response to the destruction of, or to the fall of Jerusalem. So because they rejoice in the fall of Jerusalem and therefore it's God, God says, I will judge and destroy, you know, um, Tyre, Sidon, Egypt, Babylon, everyone. 
And then in chapters 38 to 39 of Ezekiel, uh, you get almost a, an apocalyptic type, Gog and Magog, who we don't really know who they are, um, but it seems to be the, the symbolic, all the enemy nations of God gather against him and are conquered and are destroyed. And uh, when you think about it that way, and you think about also some of the uh, conflict in the intertestamental period, uh, you can understand why when Jesus comes as Messiah, um, half the apostles think, great, it's time to fight. So they think now is the time for judgment on the nations. That's why the teaching of Jesus, love your enemies, um, and, and his interactions with Roman centurions, etc., is so surprising, so shocking. It's like, well, hang on, you're supposed to be laying the smack down on these enemies, but you, you seem to be forgiving them. What's going on? And so what that uh, moves towards is that um, the, the true warfare is the powers behind the enemy nations, which is anything that sets itself up against God. And so in Revelation, you see the full war happen, but it is a spiritual war against the powers, but there are earthly expressions of it. So it's sort of a mix. And so uh, for us as New Testament believers, we also have a bit of a mixed experience. And, and this is true with our world at the moment. Um, so you think about the cultural attack on us from real people, and there's a real sense in which at the same time we are desperate enemies, and yet we love them and want them forgiven, etc. And so I think that's actually the, the richness of the theme of um, the enemies of God, the judgment of God, etc. I hope that's helpful. We go to the front, uh, Larry. I was just wondering, is there some particular uh, relevance of uh, Ezekiel being referred to by God as the Son of Man, as against, uh, you know, obviously Jesus? Uh, yes, thank you. That is a great question too. The Son of Man is such an intriguing um, title, and it does come from the Old Testament, so it's, Jesus is not the first one to use it. And I think Jesus is deliberately drawing on its use here in Ezekiel, but also in Daniel as well. So Daniel is, is a lot clearer. So in Daniel chapter 9, or is it 8? 8 or 9? Nine? 9, I think. 7? <laughs> That's right. It is 7. Um, uh, you see um, the, um, the appearance of the one like a son of man, uh, etc., and, and coming in, in to receive glory from God and, and bring judgment and salvation. So that's obviously a very clear reference. But in Ezekiel, uh, Son of Man is, is more used by God, I think, as a title of humility. Um, but yet, Ezekiel is the one who sees the vision of the glory of God and is his particular uh, immediate messenger. And, um, and, and the theme of the glory of God in particular, I think, is... is encapsulated by this is the Son of Man who saw the glory of God, which I think lies behind some of Jesus' self-reference as Son of Man too. Um, but it is a, it's a very enigmatic title, and I don't think we've actually got to the bottom of what Jesus exactly means by taking that particular title on himself. Yep. Thanks, Dan. Um, so I understand that the, the, the big message of Ezekiel is um, the holiness of God and for us we can hopefully appreciate that more. Mm. But as a Bible study leader who's trying to help my group uh, develop into Christ-likeness, what, you know, what sort of behavioural lessons or changes would I be trying to help them go with this book? What am I trying to, if you like, teach them more? help them to go to from where they are now to where they'll come afterwards? Um, yes, thank you. I, I think um, the, the main thing that Ezekiel does is that it, it basically um, ramps all the key Christian themes you know and love um, um, a thousandfold. So, sin, bad. We know that. Um, but you kind of go, well, yeah, and I sin all the time. Ezekiel says, sin disgusts God, and it should disgust you too. Uh, sin is like filth, 
before God, and it should be like filth to you too. So if you are living in sin and just going, yep, no worries, you need to repent, and you, need, you want to feel that. And the way you feel that is by being confronted with God through his word and, and a vision of his holiness. But it's also God saves us by grace. Of course he does. It's great. Love it. But Ezekiel said, no, 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 no. The holy God who cannot stand sin has embraced the sinner. How can that be? So Ezekiel would say, look, every day we should be falling on our knees and just saying, how wonderful, how, how beautiful you are, God. I want to live for you. So that's the way that Ezekiel um, conveys his message. And, and the starkness of it, um, I think, is, is the power of Ezekiel. So, you know, again, I, I'll, I'll just keep on referring to this because I can. Um, as an Asian, you know, we, we're not high on the scale of emotional expression usually. Uh, but Ezekiel really challenges me to actually say, look, don't let your um, reticence and your conservative nature get in the way of responding to God with your whole heart. You know, let it out. Um, so I was, um, I was listening to a song on the way here, uh, which is uh, my favourite song at the moment, Christian song. Uh, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And uh, just some of the words, um, you know, the... Um, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. And um, as I was listening to it, I, I started to, to tear up. And I'm going, hey, whoa, 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 come on, I'm a bloke, I'm an Asian, I don't do this. And I thought, no, you idiot. <laughs> this is wonderful, this, this is who I am. And, and it should actually be something that um, stirs me to my core every day. And if you read Ezekiel, you cannot help but get that impression. Well, uh, I reckon it sounds like a, um, a top place to finish. You were about to cry then, weren't you? Uh, yes, yes. That's yes. okay here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we embrace that. Hey, um, we, uh, we're um, gone for time. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. And uh, we've got a gift for you, which is... a. a Voucher to a whole bunch of nice restaurants. You can only go to one of them, but there's, you know you get to choose, which is nice, <laughs> isn't it? Um, and uh, I've just said on that note, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your passion with us. And I, I feel like we have sensed that. And our yearning to get your PowerPoint slides is actually an expression of, I think, our interest in this book, which you've kind of just um, rip the scab off or take the lid off for us. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, we would not have been able to do that without you. So um, we really are thankful for um, your time amongst us and sharing your expertise and your passion. So let's thank Dr. Dan. <clears throat> Can, Can yeah, I just say again, thank you so much. It's um, uh, It's been such a privilege and... and you know, fr can I say from Moore College, uh, just a quick note that um, w we are here for you, to serve you, and uh, we would love to hear if there's any ways that Moore College can be more effective in serving the people of God. Um, but yes, uh, as much as you've thanked me, I, I want to thank you guys for being here and for, um, for being with us tonight. Cool. Thank you. Now, if, if people do have questions they want to, um, you know, hold you up in a corner with... Um, you able to stick around the back for maybe 10, 10 sure. minutes maybe? Yep. Um, so if you've got a burning question, um, Dan will be up the back. Um, if you're a small group leader, I need to see you down the front. We'll just be a few minutes to just go through the materials. And if you're in neither of those categories, um, you're allowed to go now. It's been great having you with us. Um, Godspeed, have a good evening, and we'll see you on Sunday when we open up Ezekiel chapter 1.